Uh, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's wonderful to have you on board. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. I know we are living in difficult times, and the last month has seemed like a year. It has just been so long. Uh, but we keep strong, and we keep focused, and we keep moving forward. Now, if uh, I was a movie producer, and somebody came to me six months ago, and they said, uh, and you're producing some science fiction stuff at Hollywood, and we have this amazing new plot, and the plot is the pandemic is going to hit, uh, and it's going to paralyze the whole world, and it's going to slow everything and stop everything, basically. And, uh, and then the whole world is going to come together and fight it, and then we'll all come out, and I don't know, we have the rock as the guy in the front, and, and people like that. I would have thought that this is lunacy. And I mean, this is even beyond science fiction, but actually science fiction has become science fact. And, and, and that is rather sad, but it is true and it is with us today. I'd like to reiterate a point that I've made before, and I've heard a few stories today, so I think I'll uh, say this more solemnly rather than flippantly. And that is that there are three pandemics going on at this point in time. There's a pandemic of uh, the virus itself. The second is a pandemic of isolation and loneliness. And as two months, three months have now gone by and the social isolation has increased, people are cracking. And a lot of my, my, my healthcare friends have shared with me that people are now getting to the point where people have started cracking in terms of their loneliness and isolation. And uh, so that is one issue. And the last pandemic, the third pandemic, actually there are four, but the three I will start with. Uh, the third pandemic is a pandemic of fear and despair. If people don't have a job, you can survive a month or two. If people don't have money, they can just about manage and scrape and stretch for a month or two. Now it's getting to the point where two, three months have gone by and things are now getting tougher. So as every month goes from now, the difficulty goes exponentially. I was talking to a friend of mine uh, in London who did a, some a deep survey uh, and research on the airline industry. And what he said was, uh, he's a futurist, his name is Rohit, and he said that uh, if you look forward uh, about 30 to 45 days, about 20% of the world's airlines will file for bankruptcy of some sort of, uh, of some kind. You take another 30 to 45 days from there, another 20% will file bankruptcy. So by the end of August, we're looking at 40% of the world's airlines in some form of bankruptcy or complete closure. Then if this thing continues till the end of the year without anything really opening up, we're looking at not more than about 20% of the world's airlines working and operating the way we know them. So there'll really be a few big airlines and, and the rest will just be more local organizations and so on. So every month, six weeks, grows exponentially. And I think that is uh, one of the key questions that we have to be discussing today. So there are many elements out there, but where there are difficulties, where there is a, 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 you know, an environment of a pandemic, something good will follow. Uh, in the Middle Ages, in the Dark Ages, we had uh, the, 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 the Black Death. Uh, the, the Renaissance followed that. Then, and then we had the Spanish flu in the First World War, where there was so much dying and killing. Um, and we had the Treaty of Versailles, where the whole world was restructured in the Roaring Twenties. After the Second World War, we had a whole amount of reconstruction. Uh, after 2000, and uh, you know, the early 2000s, when the, we had the dot-com loss, many, many new countries uh, came up. Then 2008 and 2009, uh, we, we had uh, the financial crisis. And then from there came out Dropbox and uh, Google Maps and, and, and uh, you name it, WhatsApp, uh, Uber, I, Airbnb, all of these companies came out of that. So I am a great believer that this pandemic is going to unleash entrepreneurs and creative startups to come up with amazing, amazing new stuff. And there'll be a plethora of these things out there. And we hopefully from our part of the world and from the work that Roberto does at Microsoft and others around him in his ecosystem, we can actually find ways to empower young people or older people, it doesn't matter, to empower people to be able to ride this storm, to ride this tsunami of the pandemic and look into the future. And that gives us a wonderful segue uh, to bring in Roberto Croci. 
He's a managing director at Microsoft uh, for entrepreneurs and startups. He looks out to the Middle East Africa region. Um, he has a, an illustrious career. He worked with Google for many years uh, as heading the emerging markets and looking at the marketing leadership there. Uh, he's been in uh, venture capital. He has been in all sorts of different industries. Um, and as he's built up and understood the ecosystem, and uh, he's uh, my co-Harvard Business School alum, so I, I enjoy it and respect that. He's an amazing man, easygoing. You know, he's left his ego aside, and he's just a hardcore, real, nice, decent person. Roberto, really, really welcome. A privilege to have you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Tariq. Um, I'm also setting up uh, here the presentation. If you slide these slides, we're going to use. Can you can you see it? Yes, yeah. we can see it. So sure. and I've done the basic introduction, but uh, you can say a few words, and then perhaps uh, you can take us into your presentation, and we'll take it from there. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks, thanks, Tariq, for for the great intro and setting the stage. I mean, uh, it's, it's just a pleasure being here. As we were discussing, there is no right or wrong answer, right? So it's uh, sharing, opening up a conversation. Um, talking about the ecosystem, um, uh, talking about mindset. So today we are going to focus as, uh, you know, uh, the conversation on uh, mindset and response. So how to, uh, from an entrepreneurial perspective and startup perspective, uh, what are the right, what is the right mindset that can help, uh, you know, uh, go through uh, this, this period of time and honestly, uh, not only during this period of time, uh, looking more long term. Um, you, you introduced me, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, my professional experience, but uh, who uh, uh, I am uh, really, uh, you know, this, this picture defines more who I am. Uh, this is my mom and uh, my dad. Um, so uh, there has been, uh, you know, uh, the, the more, I mean, uh, all the experiences I had in my life, uh, I, I, know, I learned uh, a lot of things. But uh, now that we have a lot of experts around and talking and talking, I still have not seen, you know, uh, in terms of common sense and learnings, uh, uh, something more that I would add to what uh, my mom and my dad gave me. Um, so my dad uh, is an entrepreneur, was an entrepreneur. Um, uh, he founded his own company. He, he was 11 when uh, the World War II, uh, you know, started uh, in, in, in Europe. Uh, and so, uh, you know, he told me stories about how was it like uh, during those uh, those times. Um, they were in, a, in an apartment where with, they were five uh, siblings and, you know, they were hiding the bread uh, between them because it was not enough. They were using clothes to go and uh, pick up some, some food. So he went through all this. So this is where he's coming from. And uh, he didn't get a PhD or like uh, us, we had the privilege to study at Harvard or, you know, prestigious uh, universities. But, you know, he didn't add any uh, title uh, in his curriculum. Uh, so what, what he learned, he learned uh, by doing. He learned, uh, you know, in his life. And uh, he set up, uh, you know, his own company. Uh, and it also had uh, uh, ups and downs and a lot of downs in, in the sense that even his brothers, uh, you know, were kind of his competitions to all some of his clients and uh, uh, one brother was more the accountant, uh, you know, made him lose a lot of money. So he went also into depression in his life, um, but he was able to recover. And you see here, you know, um, uh, you know, the column uh, as well of the family, my mom as well, that has been, they've been working uh, together. They've been raising a family of three. Uh, so sometimes we hear stories of leadership shared as something new in the world uh, or new trends or new things, but sometimes the answers are already there. So, uh, and this raised the question to me, who are the leaders today? Who are the real heroes? Who do we trust? Um, and uh, this is my cousin. Uh, my cousin is a doctor. He, 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 is, uh, he is working in one of the hospitals close to Milan, uh, which has been one of the countries where we have seen this outbreak hit the most. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, he has been uh, uh, telling me since the February, you know, about, uh, you know, what he was living in his own hospital, a number of cases of pneumonias, which was very strange at a time where in the news we were still reading, ah, it's a normal flu, it's only, you know, uh, uh, getting old people, while there were young people coming to the hospital not being able to breathe. Uh, so, uh, again, the question about who do we trust, who are the real heroes, who are the real leaders? So uh, after a month, uh, you know, uh, helping um, uh, in extreme conditions, I would say in ICU, he also tested positive. 
his two daughters. So, uh, you know, and his wife is also a doctor. So they were both working in emergency and uh, they gave, you know, all what they had to help. Um, uh, and he went through the experience. I mean, he, is, he spent a, a week in ICU. Now he's recovering. Uh, I think the worst is behind. But a cousin of theirs, you know, uh, couldn't make it. Uh, and the reason is because these two daughters, they were both doctors. There was no, nobody they, you know, they could leave them to, and they had to give to some, to, to have someone helping them with, with the daughters. So the cousin also then tested positive and unfortunately couldn't make it. So um, I wonder, you know, uh, and I love this picture, you see who are the real heroes, right? So who uh, we want our kids to play uh, with and to dream of uh, uh, when, when they grow up and what are the values that they inspire them? There are also stories about the story of this uh, anesthesiologist, um, James Nielsen in the US, who basically uh, is inspiring because basically in, in what they've been able to do uh, is uh, uh, they, uh, they have been able to you know, build solution under stress, under pressure, uh, you know, in a context where they did it themselves. Uh, you know, in, in the hospital, they came out with this uh, uh, structure that was uh, helping to protect themselves and patients. Uh, and the whole thing, if you, if you read the story, this is very interesting because the, uh, James, uh, uh, you know, used to, uh, uh, to do camping when he was uh, a child and he, he certainly didn't expect to be using his camping uh, technique, uh, you know, in his career as an anesthesi anesthesiologist. Uh, and the story about how they were doing this, how they activated, you know, the help to uh, experiment this, this uh, structure that they built to build protection. Basically, it's inspiring. They set up an Apollo 13 team, basically, uh, that was really focused on come up with innovations to fill gaps in medical supplies and personal protective equipment. And uh, they were able to share ideas on GitHub. They were able to have CEOs and, and, and doctors collaborate. And if you, uh, if you see the story, well, one of the consistent feedback is um, that there were CEOs of companies talking to technicians, talking to faculty and everybody in between. So uh, the aspect of collaboration came out as being, uh, you know, the community being together and, and helping each other with uh, building on top of each other strengths and uh, ideas. So um, uh, the thing is, uh, uh, we have been hearing uh, a lot about, uh, uh, you know, the COVID-19, and we all know that this is not just about a few weeks uh, lockdown, it's, uh, it's, uh, and then back to normal life is more until there, there is no vaccine, probably, probably uh, restrictions of some sort will continue. Uh, so uh, all of us have uh, to get used to a sort of what, you know, you hear saying a new normal. Uh, and this comes also with uh, the concept of change, right? So change is painful, uh, but it's more painful not to embrace change to grow. Um, and to me, and I raised this at the beginning, is also a matter of uh, uh, trust. Um, uh, trust comes with uh, professionalism on one hand. You know, you have to behave like a pro, so you keep your promises. That, that's where you build, uh, you know, reliability. Uh, you, you, you are sort of a role model, right? Uh, and you, and all, the foundation of this is your knowledge. At the same time, it's also uh, about intimacy, about who you really are. Uh, you, at least today, uh, we, we tend not to trust robots or AI yet. Uh, we trust real persons. So uh, it's not a matter of being too perfect as uh, a lot of people try to. Uh, it's about relationships. Relationships is about who you are. Um, and, uh, you know, the fraction is ego. Uh, don't be a jerk, right? Uh, people can smell your ego from, from far. And it's more about let other people shine or build on uh, others' ideas or other successes, as in the story of James, uh, you know, in, in the ICU or uh, in the story of many other stories that we hear these days. Um, so uh, uh, what I wanted to share is, uh, and feel free to, you know, let's make this session as more interactive as possible, Tarek, but uh, the yeah. idea for today, as you asked me, uh, was to, uh, you know, uh, share a couple of things uh, on um, enemies. So who are the enemies that we, uh, we can fight or we, we, we need to know them when we talk about mindset? Uh, and uh, the approach would be evolving uh, some to on know your enemies for me is love your enemies embrace your enemies and love your enemies and we will talk about that and mindset we will not cover leadership today most likely but you know it's and it's it's a bit provoking in the sense that it's more you know to raise the conversation and to understand uh, you know what uh, what could be what the feedbacks are 
So when it comes to enemies, uh, some of the enemies that you know we we face every day uh, are uh, these are not all for sure, but some of them uh, that have to do with mindset and how we respond is for sure short termism. Especially, I would say in this region is is a very much a short term uh, uh, region. Uh, it's competition. Uh, copy and paste, the GMOD, we will go through, through this. Uh, so um, uh, let, let's, let's actually, uh, I would say, jump into, into those and uh, have a conversation, if you agree. Um, yeah, I mean, this is great. If you can go back to the previous slide, uh, please, Roberto. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think uh, you put a, <laughs> a lot of enemies in there. Disagreement, uh, that opens up a lot of conversation. Uh, that's amazing. Um, but what about the others? I mean, copy and paste, uh, Gmoot, uh, know it all. <laughs> How are those enemies? Yes. Uh, so let's let's go let's go let's go let's talk about these enemies. Uh, if yeah. you agree. So uh, I would say I was mentioning this region is very much uh, short term. Uh, think about uh, you know. Uh, uh, think about even how public traded companies are operating today when we share the earnings and you know the results is uh, on a quarterly basis uh, but uh, uh, and you know now we hear more and more people especially in the startup ecosystem oh we should shift from growth at any cost as it has been you know what has been pushed for some time to profitability and that comes with more long term thinking uh, so one one uh, so this is uh, uh, so one thing that uh, for example I learned is for example having a contrarian way of thinking might help uh, so because short term in the end is part of uh, long term right so uh, one one uh, C level I've been working with in my previous job in uh, is it was a CMO of uh, one of the largest uh, multinational uh, globally his approach was to look at the end of the year as the beginning beginning of the of another year. So uh, the way he structured, the way, so the way he was looking at the budget was the first four months, he tried to take the profits for the whole year. The next four months, his focus was to reward, uh, you know, uh, his employees heavily. And the last four months was to, you know, uh, uh, spend like hell in advertising uh, because everybody else has gone out of budget and he, he was there to share, uh, you know, um, to have a higher share of voice and to build the momentum for the next four months. So it's a slight shift in mindset, but uh, having sometimes a contrarian way of thinking can help also into uh, moving from being short-term to long-term. Long, short-term is, is definitely an enemy because uh, a lot of um, a number of the decisions that are taken or a number of the approach that you see uh, come with a very short term in terms of a hey, give me the revenue or I want to you know go for an exit uh, while there is then little impact or a little uh, legacy left to uh, society so um, the other the other thing that comes with short term and is very re related is uh, inertia so inertia, uh, you know, by definition, uh, refers to kind of uh, resistance to change, right? So um, uh, this is this comes also with a, a lot of uh, you know uh, the learnings that we also got, for example, uh, with the exploit explore model with Tushman, uh, Professor Tushman at HBS, is that uh, you know uh, the, the, there are companies that uh, you know if you look even at the standard the 500 uh, companies, um, a lot of of those are not making in the list anymore, right? But uh, some of those have been able to make it. So what is that makes a company durable or what is that makes them reinventing themselves? What is that make them, uh, you know, uh, being able to fight the enemy, sorry, the enemy of inertia um, and how they are able to shift or to manage multiple alignments. So not just the alignment for exploring or incremental innovation, with the alignment for more exploit, uh, sorry, exploiting for incremental innovation, with the alignment for more exploring or looking uh, to new things. So inertia one is definitely, yeah. One sorry. of the words that I use for inertia, not just inertia, but uh, why some of these companies are struggling is the, the immune system. Uh, you know, when you do a, a kidney transplant, first you have to have an immune uh, suppressant, and then you can do this uh, transplant. Uh, so uh, a lot of these companies are stuck without any kind of immune suppressant and everything is habit and everything is there forever. And this is how it's always worked. Family companies, a lot of more traditional companies. And we'll get to that in a second. Now, in this environment, now that we've, the, 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 the rule book has been thrown out, uh, Roberto. So the issue of inertia should really go away, shouldn't they? Because there are no rules anymore. The immune system has been completely suppressed. Everything is fresh. 
So, I mean, that inertia line should just almost disappear, shouldn't it? It, it, it probably should, but there is also this sort of uh, status quo bias, in my opinion, where when people are in doubt, they do nothing. Or, uh, you know, the usual say uh, that is still there, uh, even these days, that, you know, uh, nobody has ever been fired because, uh, you know, they purchase from, you know, the big supplier that is, comes with a, as an assurance, but maybe is not the right, uh, you know, thing to do or the, the thing that is going to really help or, uh, you know, uh, achieve something, something else. Uh, so, yeah, it should, it should, in my opinion, as well. Uh, but then, uh, you know, uh, human behavior doesn't, necessarily change, you know, uh, as fast as uh, we, we might expect. Also, the other point and the other enemy that maybe relates to that is also, and, and I think it connects to what you were saying, is uh, uh, how you look at competition. Competition usually is, uh, you know, the definition of enemy, the competitors are your enemy. Uh, but uh, I've been lucky enough to work for uh, two of the companies represented here. Um, and uh, I would say these three uh, people, uh, if you look at uh, what they think about competition, is really uh, different than what uh, you know, other uh, CEOs or founders think about their competition. So uh, I totally remember at Google, for example, Larry Page was really, uh, this, this was really coming as his job was to, to have employees not to think uh, about competition, uh, because our job is to think about things that is not uh, been done yet. Uh, and by definition, if our competitors knew the thing, uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't tell it to nobody else, to anybody else, right? So it was the shift, it, it's, it's a really big shift. If you, if you, uh, you know, look at competitors in that lens and you, you don't look at competitors in a way, but you focus on, uh, you know, uh, what you have on your plate and what you are trying to build and you connect with customers and you really spend most of the time to understand them. Uh, that's that's a totally different uh, shift. Uh, um, that's a totally different shift in mindset. is uh, is more along the lines of uh, you know signals and noise. is more uh, you know uh, focusing on the signals that help you to uh, grow rather than the whole noise that is around. Uh, because if you spend too much energy uh, thinking about the noise, ev uh, you know every everybody is is making a lot of of that noise, and you can you know. Uh, lose important energy towards what's most important for you and your uh, long-term plans. So uh, think different about competition is, is a signal. Uh, Roberto, can I hold you here? Because, I mean, these three are uh, amongst the, the, the greatest... Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Can you go back to the previous slide, please? Uh, I so went, holding you back yeah. here, uh, one of the important things for me... Yeah. One of the most important things here is that uh, the disparity that is there between the, the top five companies, and we did a survey on this, that what portion of the S&P 500 will be covered by, today it's 20%, by the top five companies. Three of them are there, and you add, add another two, which is Apple and, 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 and Facebook. And by definition, these five companies have 20%. And the question was, where will we be in 2030? And the general consensus was around 60% of the market cap is going to be with these five companies. So, number one, disparity of earnings. These, these guys will be trillionaires, not even billionaires. So that's issue number one. And so how, how does one square that circle? Um, that's, the, that's an issue. Disparity of income. Uh, you are in the startup uh, entrepreneur environment, so everybody is just trying to set up a company to sell to one of these folks um, because they have so much data, they have all the AI, they have all the platforms, and everybody is just there to sell to these five demigods. Is this a healthy environment to have such big oligopolists, basically? Um, normally, oligopoly is two, but like in, in, in this case, I'll stretch the economic... Uh, uh, definition to five, and the, these are the fangs and the bats in, uh, in China. So the fangs and bats, these 10 companies are running the world. Where do you see entrepreneurship and startups within this ecosystem? Uh, uh, I, yeah, great point, great point, Tarek. Uh, so my, my feedback is, uh, you know, uh, it's all about uh, openness and uh, what, what these guys have been doing extremely well at the beginning when they set up their, their companies is being focused, focusing uh, on the users and connecting to the users and build something that was really 
uh, you know, relevant to uh, the users. And some of them, like if you say, if you take Satya, has been able also to reshift, uh, you know, a big, uh, if you want, uh, if we can call dinosaur into something more agile and more connected to users again and to what's, uh, you know, to growth and to what's relevant to, uh, to users. So uh, to your point, uh, how uh, this would fit with the startups entrepreneurship? Yes, you're right. A lot of startups and I've been there, uh, you know, and I'm there, you know, a lot of startups want to sell to, to these guys. Um, uh, what these guys are looking for into startups is definitely something that, you know, is the famous, the, the toothbrush uh, experiment that if you don't use, if, if you're building a product that people don't use at least twice a day, probably I'm not interested in what you're doing. So they're really looking at, at scale. But uh, I can tell that these, uh, these companies are, all the are also building ecosystem. So uh, these companies are not uh, that selfish as sometimes you can read, even if, of course, there are gray areas. There are definitely areas of, uh, you know, uh, that, that needs to be addressed in terms of privacy, safety, in terms of a number of things. I'm not saying that, definitely. But at the same time, they are enabling ecosystems. So, uh, for example, if uh, these companies can connect startups to customers to either validate their assumptions, so build better products, or to grow their business. These companies have a huge role that they can play in connecting innovation with corporates and new ideas and startups, um, uh, avoiding to reinvent the wheel whenever use cases or problems have been solved by brilliant startups that, you know, uh, it, what we were saying before is uh, building on each other's strengths, um, building on uh, each other uh, assets. So that, that's, that's the growth mindset that comes. So these guys are doing that internally. And these guys are very, uh, so these companies are also failing. Uh, these companies are failing a lot more than people would imagine. I've seen a lot of failures at Google, uh, Microsoft I just joined, but uh, you know, and Google has seen a lot of failures, a lot of projects that have been killed, organizations have been changed every six months. Who else in the corporate world would you know, be changing organization that doesn't mean five people is, is uh, repurposing or restructuring teams or uh, you know refocusing people to OKRs that make sense. So I don't see this agility uh, in, in the corporate world and uh, you know nobody gave these people this agility. They build it in terms of the culture. So it all starts with the culture of, of the company. And yeah. you know this this is uh, this is they, they've cracked the code. They've cracked the code, they, cracked the code. they built the platforms yeah. and they, yeah. they are in a in a very good position uh, for the time being. A, yep. a, a tough question, a quick follow-up, tough questions, uh, but we don't want to dwell on it, but we move on, but at least it should be there in, in the back of our minds. Should these companies by law uh, and by their corporations be broken up into smaller units to make them agile, to make them adaptable, because too big to fail is starting to happen as far as the banks are concerned, and none of the banks are represented here. Um, so this becomes one of the critical questions in, and there is history. Uh, in 80s, the 1980s, 1990s, uh, Bell Atlantic was broke, broken up into baby bells. And uh, so telecoms industry was getting too dominant and too controlling, and therefore some kind of legislation had to come. So I don't want to get this into a political environment, but I just wanted <laughs> us to register the fact that these are the kinds of questions that we will be asking post-COVID. And I'll, I'll be asking a whole series of post-COVID types of questions. No, it makes sense. It makes sense to ask the question. I mean, uh, and there is no, uh, you know, uh, wrong or right answer, I would say at this stage, meaning that there is a trade off, right? It's always a compromise. I agree with you that uh, if uh, that becoming too big, uh, you know, it's, it's at the expenses of uh, values and principles and jobs and, you know, uh, society, societal impact, then yes, at some point it might be uh, maybe something that might make sense. At the same time, uh, what these companies can achieve with the scale that they have and the, the, the culture that they are able to have you know, with what they're doing, it's also, you know, these companies are also having a, a huge uh, impact on society in creating jobs, but also pushing the boundaries on a number of things that are helpful to society, despite there might be gray areas where we have seen that probably all of these three uh, companies have been, you know, some sort of um, uh, issues in terms of transparency in terms of privacy in terms of other things but i would say uh, uh, you know the 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 the, the values of, of these companies are uh, uh, in principle for good then uh, it's it's it, there are gray areas where i would say yes it might be a, an interesting conversation 
uh, to see what else or what could be uh, you know the future given that that wouldn't be the solution though to uh, have uh, necessarily uh, having the uh, next wave of uh, innovation coming from elsewhere because it's not just by breaking this up that uh, you know uh, yes others might uh, you know uh, grow in terms of businesses but it's not by breaking this up that we might have more uh, a wealthier range of uh, ideas uh, you know because these these companies have the right culture to get uh, to 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 build ideas it's not necessary that if you break this up someone else can um, uh, with, with the right culture or the right uh, approach to it. So okay, it's moving, moving on. Yeah. Moving on. Yeah. Look, so other enemies that we, uh, we, we are facing is definitely, you know, the, the approach of uh, knowing it all. Right. So that, that's, that comes <laughs> we, we all know some of them, don't we? Exactly. <laughs> uh, exactly. But the, the point here is, uh, um, it's okay not having, uh, you know, all the answers. So that's where people uh, get stuck sometimes is the fear of being wrong, the fear of judgment from other people. Uh, it's okay to tell someone, look, I don't know, but if I trust you, if, if I believe in your values, I also trust that you can get me those answers. Just, you know, sometimes is going back home and do some homeworks. Uh, you know, you don't have, especially in a more complex and uncertain world, more and more, uh, you know, people that are in decision-making positions don't have the right answers, don't have all the answers. So this is, uh, okay, so know it all is a big enemy. Um, one big enemy that we have, and this, uh, I would say, is very relevant, I would say, in this region, is the fact that uh, uh, founders or a lot of startups jump too quickly to uh, the solution space, that is, a founder comes with, you know, uh, he loves his baby, the idea that he had the product he's building, and that's great. But then he never challenges assumption in terms of what is this for? What, what is this thing that I'm doing is solving for which pro What is the real problem? Is it a fraction of a problem? So how, in that case, I would that connect with the other fractions? Is it, is it really, is it a really big problem? Uh, and, and it's, it's obvious today. I mean, it's something that is not really, but, but, you still see a number of startups in this region. There is short-term thinking with, you know, jumping too quickly on the solution space. Uh, and there is, uh, you know, not enough time spent on talking about what is the real, what are the real problems. So um, our whole, uh, our whole uh, culture of asking questions diminishes as we grow older. Uh, kids ask three to 400 questions a day. Grown-ups ask about 30 questions a day. So exponentially they have gone down. Uh, so I think uh, it, it is important that we start asking better questions, a whole different series of questions. My partner, Paul, is a great believer uh, in this, is ask the right question and spend more time on asking the question. But guess what? Our education system, our university system, our work system is all solution oriented. You know, and I, how many times has a manager said to me, don't give me your questions, just show me the solution. <laughs> Go away, just get yeah. me the solution. So that's become part of our corporate culture. And then that obviously kills part of the, uh, uh, the entrepreneurial spirit. Look, uh, Tariq, I was having a, a super- There are a lot of questions coming in, uh, Roberto. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let, let me know which one are uh, more relevant. Uh, but to your point, uh, we can definitely uh, take some of the questions. Uh, now, uh, to your point, I was having a super cool um, 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 uh, chat with a with a student uh, entrepreneur. He's in uh, he's 14 mm -hmm. uh, years old here in the region, and at some point he was saying something like, uh, "I asked him a question about uh, you know how he would have uh, uh, how was he interested to join one one initiative we are doing, and uh, he, he told me something like, uh, "Yes, but uh, uh, I don't want uh, it to be too much professional." Uh, and I said, what do you mean by professional? Yeah, you know, because all these people there uh, all uh, seems to have the right answers. But, you know, uh, I, I, we, we uh, you know, uh, we, me and my co-founder are asking a lot of questions. And he seems to talk with, you know, and he was 14 years old. <laughs> so uh, to your point, definitely, it's, it's a matter of, again, culture. But uh, uh, one thing that might uh, happen in some schools are already doing is embedding entrepreneurship as a mindset in schools, high schools already, it would be a great thing to do, for example. Okay, so uh, why don't you finish your presentation and then we can have a face-to-face -face, uh, session in, in, the, in terms of the Q&A. Uh, uh, yeah, sure, uh, look, uh, uh, we, we, we discussed it about, uh, uh, you know, uh, spending too much uh, on uh, the wrong uh, um, 
problem. Uh, also, uh, the elephant in the room and the fact that uh, if you, if you, uh, one enemy is the fact that there is a lot of copy and paste in the sense that uh, sometimes it's easy to do, right? A consultants come with the best practices or let me copy and paste or a, a number of times, uh, uh, you know, I hear in the pitch, uh, uh, oh, we want to be the Uber of this, the Google of that, the Facebook of this. Uh, or uh, sometimes I visit physically and space and say, oh, we are doing innovation. You know, we put this football here, this gaming area here. It's not just by, you know, putting in there that you are innovative or, you know, by copying and paste like that. It's, it's, it, it has to be part of the culture again and context matters. So where users are and, and what is their intent behind, uh, uh, you know, a certain thing matters. And, uh, you know, uh, not many companies or startups are really uh, having the right tools or mindset to, to understand that. Um, also, the um, uh, what you know the the uh, GMO, uh, GMO OT is is uh, you know get me one of of those is is you know this uh, impulsory sometimes need for decision makers to oh they see something that is super cool and say hey I want one of those and then all the budget goes with that without really stepping back and thinking uh, what makes sense so this is an enemy I mean it it always needs to uh, uh, drill down to uh, you know what 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 is relevant and is part of uh, you know what what your team embraces as a culture and if, if it's part of what who you are as a company. Um, so the what if here and the final enemy uh, that we put here uh, is the uh, COVID-19 is what if COVID-19 is not an enemy but something that uh, you know K is coming here to uh, help us rethink a number of things. And these are just some ideas but um, uh, you know but this connects to mindset is yes True, there are a number of small, medium businesses, startups that are directly hit and impacted. Of course, there is a runway to extend. Of course, uh, you know, there is a consideration on cash flow, but still, uh, what if uh, there is a relief that allows you to uh, survive for a few months more and then what? So that uh, the mindset and the long-term thinking should, should have already been there and should be there. Um, so that, that's where, that was the link to, to mindset. Uh, and, uh, you know, the one slide is, is all about uh, you know, moving or shifting, helping people to shift from, uh, or companies to shift from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset. A growth mindset starts from the belief that everybody, uh, you know, has a potential and everybody can, can change uh, their mindset and can grow. Uh, so, and, and the way you, you, you foster that is with people that are insatiably curious, uh, that take risks, that embrace uh, uncertainty. So that's, that's the thing, that's, that's a culture of failure as well that, uh, you know, it's not really part of the region. Even the people that talk the talk and say, yes, the culture of failure because they rode in the book, they visited the Silicon Valley and they this, do, did this and that. But they are the ones that after one or two quarters are on your neck saying, where are my numbers? Where are the results? It's the same people. So uh, it's, it's a culture of failure, meaning that you, you need to turn your company from a know-it-all to a learn-it-all. So every single... Uh, process every single activity should bring back learnings uh, because you have been trying um, and this is difficult to do at a time where there is uh, more uncertainty so first of all I would say and this is my personal point of view uh, the way I, I would navigate personally uncertainty is I build I built my belief sets so, and this is uh, mine I mean uh, it doesn't have to be the one I put in this slide this is what I really believe I really believe in an unrelenting quest for the truth, take responsibility in a causal sense, you know, uh, not play victim, delay gratification, so never go for, for example, low hanging fruit like goals, but be more like a giraffe, you raise your neck and you go for higher risk, higher results. Uh, this is the way I, I think, so this is the beliefs that guide my uh, approach and everybody could have their own beliefs, but I believe if you have this set of beliefs, for example, this is what helps you navigate uncertainty because nobody has the answer today with things changing so fast uh, okay. to uh, you know, guide you through, through uncertainty. And it's also uh, a matter of uh, uh, what is your legacy. Um, I started with a picture of my father has been an entrepreneur. Wherever I go, every people say, oh, you are the son of uh, Giacomo. Yes, everybody gets a smile on their face. That's for me, his leg, part of his legacy. Would you be able, or would the entrepreneurs, would they, uh, all of you know, the startups are entrepreneurs there, would, would, would they be able to tell that this would be their legacy or what, could, what would be their legacy? And to me, the, the, the tip here in terms of mindset is starting with the end in mind. 
so what do you want your customers to uh, uh, you know remember you for or what do you want to customers to talk about you uh, you know in, in, in what way you want customers to, to promote or to talk about you those those are your ambassadors right so yeah. starting with that in mind is 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 uh, part of the mindset where uh, i don't see this uh, uh, happening all the time um, and to go back to this point of resilience i told you the story of my father for example he had a lot of uh, you know uh, you know uh, ups and downs in his life and moments that have been really uh, you know extreme or uh, dramatic or really tough but it's the ability to bounce back it's the ability to uh, you know uh, adapt uh, you know uh, um, into uh, a world that is changing fast and but to bounce back always so uh, a few uh, takeaways a few learnings i got in my experience in terms of how to develop this in your startup as we're focusing more on startups and entrepreneurs is definitely as a founder you need to have clarity of purpose that's that's what people you, you need to inspire yourself before inspiring others so and, and you need to transmit to, to share this clarity with your teams and now you know there are a lot of you know the canvas out there the business model canvas the empathy map canvas frameworks consultants coming in with their framework because it's scalable it's easy to you know provide these services but uh, you should always allow freedom within a framework because it's never about the framework. It's more about how you uh, tap that into your culture and you, you should have that freedom and the freedom should be in your communication, should be rapid, scrappy. These people that full of ego that talk about this financial language that they only, uh, you know, it belongs to their world. This is uh, done. <laughs> it's not the language of uh, startups. Um, it's not the language of the mindset that you would have to tap into opportunity quickly and to shift. Um, you need to build interdependence in your team. You need to hire, in my opinion, this is again my experience, it doesn't have to be the truth and it's, it's a debate, but fiercely independent people, but people that also respect the contribution of others so that they build on others, even if they bring uh, you know, their perspective to the table. It's not the yes men that you see in many corporations, you know, you, know, you want to, you know, go up the ladder and you know manager is bringing their his friends and yes yes uh, but there is no challenge there so uh, at some point uh, if you're not being challenging your business or ideas then you know it will come a point where uh, you are stuck uh, and abundance of spirit so generosity um, you know pass the credit keep the blame so uh, it's all about uh, uh, you know having others shine and um, being there to make that happen um, let me know if Martha, you want. We've got about 15 minutes to yeah. go. Um, yeah. We have a whole bunch of questions. So unless you want to make a final uh, comment, uh, we should go into let, some let, of the more let, direct questions. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's jump into the questions. I think it's more relevant for the audience. Okay. So do you want to unshare that so we can see you? Uh, yep. Give me one second. Uh, I want to keep uh, your invitation. This guy. Yep. Unshare is here. Here we, we go. Here we go. All right, super. Thank you for that. You were very philosophical in that uh, presentation. I think one of the most, uh, uh, I mean, it's great to have your dad as, as an entrepreneur, but I think, uh, and Paul also mentioned in one of his remarks, uh, mothers are the greatest entrepreneurs in the world, aren't they? Yes, yes. Absolutely. I show, in fact, that the picture was not my father alone. And, uh, you know, they both have been entrepreneurs. And, and my, my mother, for example, um, uh, she has been uh, probably the CFO, if I can say as well, of the, of the company. So luckily enough uh, for yeah. my father. But yeah, she's been, she, she both have been uh, complementing each other. And mothers, yes, absolutely. I, I've, I've always had in front of me an example of a woman who has been able to take my father out of the downs, uh, he wouldn't have been able alone himself. Uh, grow a family of three and grow the business and you know uh, the, the company that my father as an entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur set up. So, um, and and today I, I sometimes hear thinking about this you know uh, leadership thing about uh, you know something new with. I've I've always seen these examples in front of my eyes. I totally agree with you. Uh, yeah. So I have an opportunity thesis, an opportunity that's going on at this point in time, and. Uh, and I'll put that opportunity uh, in place and then ask you the difficult questions of the kind of young startups that you see. And my opportunity thesis is that if we can build trust, safety, and consistency and context, which is, uh, that is control, the businesses 
post-COVID will be built around that. Now, whichever industry I've been evaluating, if we can, in terms of the future, if we can build that, uh, some consistency, safety, and trust, whether it's the restaurant industry or the uh, commercial real estate industry or bricks and mortar retail industry, whichever industry, and we will go that into those in depth. So if that is the thesis, are you seeing young people come to you and say, Roberto, I have a new product, which is not another Facebook, I mean, a, I don't know, a home delivery app, but I am coming in with something that will build trust, provide safety for people, and uh, I, I can have something which is consistent. Are people coming in with those kinds of thoughts? There are people coming in with those thoughts. There are people that are uh, really thinking about, uh, you know, uh, uh, what is uh, they, they start they i mean it's super i mean it seems simple but it's not they really uh, connect and start from users and understand uh, you know where are the gaps where what is that is missing when you mentioned about trust for example uh, you know uh, uh, there are there are uh, entrepreneurs and founders sometimes young founders that come with ideas on how to build how to build you know, solutions that would, uh, you know, address uh, some of the largest problems, but because they have an exponential thinking of what is the impact on society. So impact on society is is one of the driver and legacy is one uh, of the driver. It's not if, if uh, Twitter and WhatsApp would have thought first uh, uh, before building the MVP, how much money are, going, are we going to make out of this? We wouldn't have seen those products. So uh, the mindset of these funders is very different than the others that are, you know, yeah, let's build this, uh, we can get an exit in five years and, uh, you know, uh, with that money, whatever. Uh, so it's very different. There is more a, also a so social uh, component and then it's a long-term thinking and it's really thinking about mankind, humans as humans. Um, yeah. The problem today I see on this is, again, there is a jump too quick on, onto solutions and there is this, uh, you know, technology push, uh, like digital transformation, or uh, we, and you can see that with working from home or with distance learning, for example, what happens is um, the companies we mentioned before, they had a work from home, they have a, a work from home culture since 20 years. And the technology to work from home is already there since 20 years, but it was part of the culture because they connected uh, that to how we trust our people. Is there an issue with trust? Is there an issue with uh, how we measure performance? Yes, yes, let's do it differently. And this is impact a lot of people. But now it comes like a reactive, as a reactive approach to A, it's a denial of the situation or we are forced to be home. That's still wrong. It's a wrong way of thinking, in my opinion. It's, it, it, it doesn't connect to the years. It's connected to a reaction to a situation, but not thinking what's, what's. And distance learning would be same conversation. Digital transformation would be the same conversation, uh, being talking with a retailer, uh, you know, their chief of digital uh, didn't know, that doesn't know uh, how to, uh, uh, you know, leverage the audience. So this, this retailer has now tri tripled the uh, audience that they have on their website today because they have to close the stores in the lockdown. They have not been able to, so they didn't know how to uh, yeah. leverage that. So the, the reason I asked that question was that uh, I've been attending, yeah. The reason I was asking that question is that uh, uh, I've been attending a quite a few seminar, uh, webinars and so on where with startups and, and helping to mentor and so on. Everybody's in survival mode. Everybody's asking, how much runway do I have? Everybody wants to know whether I'll get a relief on my rental or my, uh, I don't know, registration fee. And half the people want to know whether they can still open a bank account. And, and this seems to be the kind of thing that, that we are absorbed by as opposed to some of the creative elements. Now, what do we need to do at this point in time? And how would you advise the government and sort of say, folks, we need to accelerate these startups and entrepreneurs and we need to find better, easier ways of doing things. Uh, well, if, okay, it's, it's a great, uh, so uh, we can spend, uh, uh, you know, uh, hours on this. So I would say, because you mentioned <laughs> advise the government. So uh, uh, many things, uh, first of all, uh, we talked about culture of failure. Here in this region, I don't see that. Uh, so. Yeah. Uh, you know, the government has a lot of things that they can do to enable, uh, uh, truly enable a culture of failure. Uh, sometimes I see the same startup going around, you know, three, four accelerators. Uh, it's the same, uh, you know, around that's not uh, going anywhere. So uh, I think the government or what one thing is uh, to uh, foster this creativity is one thing is um, uh, uh, helping people being more like hackers. 
uh, hackers attack every point in the protocol. They ask themselves questions like, what, what can I make this to? What can I build from it? And they expand on it. They, again, they start from someone else great things and they build something different that was not meant for that. So we need more hackers, yes? We need more hackers. We need more culture of experimentation. Decision making is different. Think about uh, the decision corporates are doing today are uh, still CFOs, right? That they have quarterly report data is aggregated and there is this quarterly earning calls. But data today is real time, um, and uh, maybe we we can go much more granular than uh, aggregated data. So who is uh, making decision today? Who is who who has the information to make decision today? Is still the CEO or is still the corporate? I don't know. Uh, so decision-making, culture of experimentation, hacker, uh, enabling the culture of failure that governments can do through many different uh, initiatives. Um, uh, and, and in some corporates, I would say sometimes is uh, cutting budgets uh, and uh, it's, it's weird to tell uh, this time because this forces people to be creative, but also uh, which would be which would be do more uh, with less, but also uh, do less with more because sometimes you see people launching uh, a number of different initiatives and nobody will remember you for all these number of things. Just do one sure. thing that has an impact. So it's yeah. it's it's all about mindset and. So anybody who's in the commercial real estate business at the moment uh, must be struggling, and and, and the office space uh, business, and there are lots of uh, uh, free zones and so on. Uh, my thesis is really can we build uh, a groundswell of support by basically saying we can sh start sharing offices. We have an office in the Dubai Media City. We'll not be able to use that. Now with social distancing, things will start changing again. Uh, so our whole, the way we need to dematerialize our future offices and recreate a new environment where we can have an environment, maybe we'll have a production studio there, which can be used by 10 entrepreneurs, not just one. So then we suddenly start sharing it in a different way and be allowed to do that within our commercial rail. So we've dematerialized our office and rematerialized it into a production environment. So things like that. And I think it, it really needs to sort of, uh, uh, you know, start pulling some, some elements together. Uh, let's also look at, so uh, folks, one of the key things, and we're coming uh, another uh, five to seven minutes to go before the hour. And uh, so let me make a couple of announcements and a couple of surveys that we have done and Roberto was kind enough to share with us. Uh, one of the announcements is that uh, we felt that, uh, and now that you've heard uh, Roberto come up with all his deep philosophical slides and, and, and really meaningful stuff, that we can't do justice to you in one session. So he's kindly agreed to do a series of three to four. And at the end of uh, June, we'll come back again. I will announce a date. At the end of July, another date. And then the end of August, another date. And uh, the next one will be a little bit more on leadership. But then we'll look at sexy industries. We'll look, look at the events industry, the airline and hospitality industry, the bricks and mortar retail industry, uh, the commercial real estate and healthcare, and all of these industries properly. So we'll spend a whole hour going deeper into these industries and saying, where is the innovation? Where are the entrepreneurs? Where are the startups and where can we look at? So that's a, a, a way forward. And I'm you know, we're very privileged that uh, uh, Roberto has agreed to, to do this with us because I think it's important because now that we have this, this uh, ocean of webinars and, and, and stuff going on, we are basically zoomed out. So now we have to start picking the best ones and the ones that give us the deepest insight and are the ones that are most authentic. And I hope we will be able to deliver that to you. So I think that's one of the, one of the key things. So uh, let's quickly go through some of the key questions, uh, Roberto. We, let's uh, try and keep the, uh, the questions uh, a little bit, answers a little bit shorter. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it says the UA government has announced that it wouldn't be increasing the, uh, uh, the VAT, which is good. Uh, uh, people were very interested in the mindset slide. Uh, Roberto, when we spoke first, I remember you, you and I, we were chatting and you said, we focus too much on the tool sets because everybody's asking for tool sets, but actually it's the mindset that the focus is required on. Can you yes. just uh, throw a little bit more emphasis on that to actually share with people that build the mindset, the tool sets will follow because they're always there. Uh, look, uh, for me, it's easy. Uh, a tool, uh, you know, uh, it's a mean to an end and you can always learn it. Uh, We're all, uh, you know, uh, great people. Uh, it's more, instead of building to-do list, uh, it's maybe is building to be lists. Uh, uh, so uh, that, that's the mindset for me. So it's building to be lists. Who, who, and and it, that requires awareness of 
who you are and who you want to be. Uh, so this is, this is uh, I would say, uh, yeah, uh, this is, I would say, number one thing. The other thing is it comes with diversity as well. Diversity is extremely important, diversity of thinking. Um, you know, um, uh, you know, the calendar is a tool and everybody has a calendar. How, how are you, for example, uh, you know, uh, spending your time. Are you spending time every week with someone that has nothing to do with your network, your expertise? You know, because those conversations are the conversation that open uh, your mind, uh, not just the gender and country, yeah. really. Uh, so, uh, and uh, here there's a lot of people talking the talk on diversity, but nothing is just talks. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I'm doing that every week. I'm spending uh, at least uh, uh, one meeting, if not more, with people that has nothing to do with my background, my experience, and yeah. just have a conversation. A lot of things happen there. So that's mindset. Uh, you know, to be least, uh, you know, uh, diversity. There, is, there are many things, and it's not philosophical, I guess. I mean, two yeah. sets, yes. I mean, two sets, uh, you know, uh, my mom, 81 years old, you have seen the picture. She learned to use Teams, to use online banking, to send emails. <laughs> Uh, not only Teams, uh, because it was blocked. Uh, no, Teams was not blocked, but many were blocked, so she had to learn also <laughs> Goodbye, Blue Jeans, 81 yeah. years. And then we talk about digital transformation. Come on, uh, I don't get it. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Mays, who uh, was our guest last week, she commented about diversity to inclusion and that whole process. Yeah. I think that, that is another critical area. Another Absolutely. important uh, question that came up, uh, and, and that was that... Uh, that you know, the general startup structure is that we write our business plan, we go out there, we present, we do a song and dance, whether, whether it's in a hackathon or somewhere else, we'll do that. Everybody is talking about making money and getting an exit and selling it to Microsoft, Google, and, and Amazon. Uh, <laughs> that's really the game, uh, the game plan. How do you differentiate between young entrepreneurs looking for an exit-based model rather than a growth-based model and how do you differentiate and how do you favor each one of them? Because every single VC I've come up with, they say, show me the exit. How are you going to exit? What is the multiple? How do you deal with that? Well, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's ultimately, it's, uh, from my perspective, it's all about people. So uh, as we said before, uh, you know, uh, you smell the ego, uh, you know, from far, you, you, you smell someone you don't trust or someone who is there, you know, uh, you smell when someone is not authentic. So, um, uh, so yeah, the values that founders have, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's something, for example, we are very keen on uh, uh, cherry picking the, 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 you know, the, the values as well that resonate with what is more long-term and has an impact on society. I think that, for example, giving voice uh, of uh, giving voice to underrepresented founders, to social entrepreneurs, to women founders, to, you know, uh, this is, we need to do more. And um, uh, it's also about the role models that we, uh, we have, because when people celebrate, you know, the rounds of funding is like, okay, guys, I go to the bank and, you know, get a loan and uh, then, hey, I celebrate. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, okay, great. I mean, it, it, it probably means that that, that is moving, uh, you know, in a good uh, in a way direction, but still, we should celebrate. Why then we don't celebrate the, the impact that those businesses are, are having on um, on humans, on society. So it all boils down to people, authentic relationship, people who they are, their values, uh, and the role models that we uh, promote and we build. Uh, I have this picture, you remember the picture, and it's not philosophical again, uh, it's a picture of the kid playing with the nurse instead of with Batman. Fine, I mean, of course, I want the kids to play still with Batman, but still also, who are the role models, who they really see as a leader, who are the real leaders. Uh, it's not about the title or the exit or the money, right? Not only. Yeah. So we, we look at, I mean, we've discussed failure a lot today. And I think uh, one of the things I presented last year to a Harvard Business School class, uh, Emerging Markets Leaders class, was they asked me how long should a CV be? And I said, uh, I said, okay, how long do you think it should be? And they said, one page. And I said, no, two pages. And they all looked at me, are you serious? Two page CV? I said, yes. I said, all of you are very smart. So all of you are now a commodity, a higher level commodity, but you're just a commodity. So this is your success CV of all the wonderful things you've done. On the other side is your failure CV. All the things you screwed up, where did you learn? How did, were you resilient? Did you have courage? Did you have humility? Do you have resourcefulness? Uh, and, and how did you bounce forward from that? I don't even say bounce back, but come out from that. 
So to me, those are the real people uh, yeah. that become, so I think every single person, every single entrepreneur should be writing a failure CV now. And, and what, your thoughts on that, because of my follow on question, quick thoughts and then I'll, I'll have a follow on question. It's more interesting. No, look, uh, uh, I, I mean, I, I agree. I agree in the sense that uh, 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 failure is, uh, is important. I mean, uh, you, if is important if you don't fail to fail. That means that yeah. uh, you, you, you really capitalize and learn uh, out of it. So that, that's important. In terms of the CV, look, uh, I've seen, you know, there are wonderful people there. Uh, there was a guy who was uh, a designer. Uh, so he, he built his CV like uh, you should have built it. So it, it became like an origami or a sort of thing. So, yes. uh, or there was a guy who will convince someone in a radio to interview him and, and he made that his CV. You know, the, the human, humans are, are incredible. So I would say, don't just stick to a framework framework. We, we talked before about freedom within a framework. So, yeah. you know, some people still go on Google and, you know, uh, templates of CV and they just fill it in. It's, uh, you know, where is your uh, mindset? Where is your soul? Where is your personality? So you, you, should, you should be yourself. Um, uh, yeah. Be because in this COVID crisis and people who will come out from this COVID crisis, the best startups and entrepreneurs are the ones who are resilient, are the ones who are resourceful, not the ones who have money, but the ones who are resourceful. Uh, mm -hmm. The ones who, are, who have courage, the ones who have authenticity, and the ones who have a purpose. They are the ones that are going to be coming out of this thing. So my question to you is, is let's say you have a portfolio within, I don't know how the structure is in Microsoft. Let's say you have 10 companies in your portfolio that you, you're nurturing and supporting, and three companies fail. Do you do an exit failure interview? What did you learn? How did you learn? What are you not going to do again? What are you going to do more of? And when are you going to be, get, be back? Because this has been a very, very expensive experiment that we have just done on you. So we want you back next month with your new project. And so how do you do that process? It's uh, yes. The short answer is yes. And the, the how is, uh, you know, is by, uh, um, uh, by uh, being able, by understanding that it's, it's, it's a, uh, Two ways. So it's not just about uh, you know uh, taking, but it's also about giving. So it's when whenever you so you should seek for feedback uh, uh, all the time. So uh, and so this is this is the this is the thing is being there, being in the conversation, being human, but also uh, you know asking for feedback. And uh, that's 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 as easy as that. Uh, honestly, Tarek. I mean, it's it's being in in there and. Uh, 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 listen to uh, you know uh, what people are telling you uh, in terms of feedback, and and now we c you can do even even in a more uh, scalable way in terms of if you need to get feedback from uh, multiple sources. But ultimately, it boils down to yes, uh, we have this failure in this exit. Uh, definitely, yes, it's it's we need to get the learning. Otherwise, uh, you know, um, we we did that. Uh, uh, you know, um, nobody nobody remember probably the Google Video Player. But everybody remember YouTube, right? So people yeah. remember the hits, not the misses. So uh, as I told you, there are a lot of failures. But if uh, in the failure you get the learning, you really understand why that thing uh, was not working and, and a number of things, then uh, yeah. Uh, and this comes from listening to real people getting out of the building so not just you know staying on your throne in, in the you know in the private office but uh, uh, and then and then asking for feedback so absolutely and i and i think as we are getting into what i would call the consolidation phase of uh, of covid-19 and we now need to start building our muscles uh, to move forward um, what are we seeing now in terms of what what kinds of people are we going to support and develop, and I'll, I'll, I'll extend this question. So on the one side is money and resources, but on the other side, uh, co corporations like uh, Microsoft or Etisalat or, uh, or the large corporations can support startups in a hundred different ways. Cash is just one of them. They can defer their payments. They can provide some, some services, things that cost you nothing. Azure costs you nothing to produce a mental one, one person. At this allowed will cost them nothing to produce that one additional person. So the marginal cost of you doing additional things is so low because you've already got the platform and the infrastructure. Why can't we have a very, very open environment and sort of say, okay, all the top 100 organizations that are still strong, 
and anti-fragile? Why can't they go out and say, okay, we're going to support 1,000 startups and we're going to support them in all sorts of ways other than just pure cash. Cash can come, but other than that. Could a, an initiative like that could be led by Microsoft or a consortium or something like that to really give them a chance? Because I don't think it's only about the money because a lot of them, you know, please, over to you. Uh, I totally agree. Uh, definitely, uh, money is, you know, uh, it's helpful, but uh, uh, it also forces you maybe to think, uh, you know, too much on long term. And you should factor in, uh, you know, uh, talking about tech startups, you should factor in the cost of technology in what you are building. So I'm not saying it's not helpful, but yeah, uh, I have a different point of view on that. So as I'm seeing competitors in a different way, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, it all starts from. Um, uh, truly uh, listening first. I give you an example. I was talking with a founder. This founder was working, uh, uh, you know, through a partner and, uh, uh, you know, the partner was assuming to help, uh, you know, the founder on a, a variety of different things. But, you know, everybody comes down with, uh, you know, their uh, the agenda that they have. And, but uh, even if everybody has an agenda because we, we hear the heart of the, you know, the, the employer we work for. But, uh, you know, there are uh, different ways of, uh, of, doing, uh, of doing that. So what I want to say is the feedback I got from this founder was that in a year time with a partner, they never got a conversation where a partner asked the, to really deep questions about what was their vision, their values, who were there them as founders, where they wanted to go, who they wanted their people to be, how they were empowering their people and what their business was about to start with. So what I'm saying is um, money, uh, yes, definitely is always uh, helpful, but uh, the support of the community uh, and uh, the support of a true ecosystem uh, uh, can also multiply efforts, uh, kind of when we say the sum is greater of the parts, right? If yeah. there is wealth and abundance of uh, generosity, spirit and ideas and sharing of knowledge, building on each other uh, strength, uh, if someone spent uh, uh, time uh, to build something that works, why should I uh, redo that same thing if I can use that you know, this API is the thing where you can build in. So there are many things there to, to do uh, beyond money. Definitely, there are many things. So um, we're running a little bit over and uh, we still have quite a few of our 80% uh, of our group uh, already still there. So let's uh, do the survey that we uh, had put out there. So folks, for, for you to enjoy. Uh, the first question was, in today's industry, uh, which of the company, uh, uh, which industries are the most ripe for disruption in this COVID global reset. And it was the hospitality, entertainment industry, the financial services, energy, healthcare. And interestingly, healthcare was a dominant leader. Why was that? Because I thought that the hospitality entertainment industry would be right up there. But it's not, it's 22%, it's while healthcare is 68%. Healthcare is 68%. Well, I mean, uh, healthcare is, is uh, uh, something probably that is also, uh, is also uh, that top I should- Top of mind. It's top, top of mind if you want. But I should be <laughs> of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, um, the guy in the, James, uh, the anesthesiologist in, in the US or my cousin as well. Uh, I know uh, we discussed uh, uh, many times about, uh, you know, what are things that are really broken uh, there. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, I, I honestly, I would have uh, voted for healthcare first as well. Um, uh, and I wish, uh, you know, there, there might be something that is uh, going to, uh, to help people more. And I know for sure working with some uh, startups in healthcare that there are ideas out there that can really impact uh, and save lives. Uh, so healthcare, I would say, connects to uh, us as humans even more than other industries because of probably also the current situation, you know, emphasized uh, probably more, yeah, for sure. But definitely I would say it is an industry that has been not disrupted for uh, a long time. And the thinking, uh, you know, there are, the thinking there, I would say is beyond, you know, building the next uh, e-pharmacy that, you know, one more, uh, uh, that's, that's fine, but it's more about, uh, again, uh, where, where, is, where, where, is the, where are the real problems in healthcare? Uh, 
so and we can talk about that in the next session where we focus sure. on the yeah. industries. We will do that. Uh, there are some other interesting findings on the healthcare sector and who are going to be the future leader. Tech would be actually a future leader. Yeah. Another quick question was uh, companies that were set up in the 20th century, which ones of them are going to be around uh, by 2030? And the examples were GE, Lufthansa, Marriott, Wells Fargo, Financial Services, and one other. I don't have it on my list. So, uh, guess who won? I mean, who won? Who lost? I mean, the one, <laughs> the industry which is going to disappear uh, by 2030, according to this one. Uh, one answer is Lufthansa from, uh, from our guests. But actually, uh, it was 57% was married. I'm surprised. I, I thought it would be Wells Fargo. I, I would have voted have for Wells Fargo yeah, because but, financial okay. services, branch-based banking, community banking, mm -hmm. that's changing fundamentally. But again, uh, the idea was to, uh, to understand exactly how. And the final question um, was, uh, how will you get the majority of your news by 2026? And the, it was, the first one was personal assistance, second one was social media, third one was your traditional uh, methods, and the fourth one would be a brand new platform that we don't yet know. Um, to guess which one won? Um, a brand new platform? Actually, no, in this particular case, the overwhelming winner was the, an AI assistant. AI so assistant. the AI assistant okay. will take out all the, the blah, blah, and the BS from it and get rid of it. <laughs> and be able to understand and learn you very well. So basically, the, it'll go out there, scrape everything, uh, and, and give you a, a synthesized version. And apparently, uh, and, and this is a, it was a global survey that was done, and then it was, uh, we did it locally also. So, so this is a little bit of sort of some fun questions that we wanted to ask. So um, going forward, uh, we have the last uh, couple of questions, and then we would wrap up. And to me, uh, in this environment, uh, what is your authentic, sincere advice? And you have been so wonderful and authentic in this entire process. What is your authentic advice to the people that are there? How do they survive the next three months? Not 12 months, forget that, next three months. What are the immediate things that we need to be able to do to be able to survive? And, and so, you know, that's the kind of counseling and crisis management stuff that people like you and I encounter regularly. What would be your advice to somebody like that? Okay, so uh, thinking about the next three months, uh, you know, to four months, basically, it's yeah, yeah, still I mean, COVID, it still hasn't come out, we still don't have a clarity, it's still, we just need to get to the next level. Well, yeah, uh, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely uh, protect your employees first. Uh, so that would be uh, top, top, top priority. Protect your employees. Focus on the things that you can control. Uh, there are a number of things that you cannot. Uh, so focus on the things you have real control on. Uh, and yes, of course, uh, there is uh, you know a number of things to you can do to extend uh, runway and uh, you know manage cash in a, in a, in a more efficient way uh, while protecting your employees. Um, uh, so these these are I would say uh, you know uh, some of uh, in my opinion the key priorities uh, for the next uh, three four months. But at the same time, I wouldn't lose the opportunity to. Um, rethink or uh, understand the what else or what is that uh, you know uh, users or customers or people uh, need and what are what are, what are the, the real problems because this situation is also uh, you know um, uh, uh, took back to surface uh, surface the uh, number of um, problems that are there uh, that have not been addressed so um, there might be opportunities and I see for example I'm working with the you know in the ecosystem here I see I saw some founders that you know, they focus on a few of the things I mentioned before, but also they were, for example, rethinking, uh, you know, partnerships in a smarter way or in a different way, joining forces with someone else that are in the same situation or similar situation, but complementing each other because of some reason. So uh, what I'm saying is uh, it, there was this quote uh, from Bernard Shaw that say uh, that Bertrand de Chart that say that we are like dwarfs uh, on uh, the shoulders of giants, right? So if if you are able to uh, uh, be aware and look at the reality through uh, different factors at the same time and rethink partnerships and those kind of things, for example, there might be 
uh, other things there that might uh, be helpful, given that, of course, uh, you know, the situation for a number of people and the number of uh, verticals is, is dramatic or is tough, uh, whereas others are benefiting uh, maybe even uh, from some uh, from this situation. But still, uh, once you, you protect your employee and you try to extend your runway and you, uh, you know, you, you have done all the, you know, the, the critical thing, I would say, I wouldn't lose a chance to, uh, you know, uh, rethink my narrative, rethink who the customers are now, if their behavior changes, if there are opportunities there where I can either pivot or, you know, partner with someone else that I wouldn't have considered before or look at competitors that, you know, in a different light or things like that. Yeah. You know, uh, in this entire series, I want every week to be some insight and something different and fresh. Uh, just to sort of uh, get people salivating a little bit, uh, I uh, have, uh, we have the, the leader of uh, the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, Orchestra in New York, in Cleveland, Rob Capello. I have interviewed him. He couldn't come at this time. So it's a, it's a taped interview, which I will play uh, next week. And the topic is the future of listening how we use music and orchestra and stuff to listen. And as we go forward, it is one of the, the attributes that we need to develop more than anything else is how to listen. So it is a whole one hour on listening. It is fascinating and there's nothing like you've ever heard before. And he uses the keyboard to show how Beethoven and Mozart used to write their symphonies for listening. Uh, the one next week is uh, the guy who is uh, one of the first people in the world in barter exchange the product to product exchange, a multilateral barter, not a, uni a unitary barter. Um, so uh, his name is Bob Bagger. He's going to be with us next Monday in the same slot. And, uh, and what he's going to do is he's, he'll, he'll be here from Seattle, Washington. And uh, what he's going to be talking about is how can we utilize all our spare assets that are lying around, uh, empty hotel rooms, uh, uh, restaurants that are not being used and, and whatever that all of the assets that we have, we have. how can we how find can we... an intelligent way to exchange with each other to find that runway for another two, three, four months? And, and that is another completely different angle that we're going to take. And then the one after that, we have five young students, all teenagers, uh, working with or Academy, where they will come in and they have created these amazing pro projects in the hackathon that they just recently did. So we saw that and we've invited them and they'll all be here together. And we talked to them about how they found to create uh, water on Mars or how they literally, those are the kinds of projects that they were working on. And they were anywhere between 10, 19 years of age. So that's our next, uh, those are our next three sessions. So they're all crazy stuff. It's crazy and, stuff. Uh, but, but you know, I mean, it's, it's fresh, it's different. I want to try yeah. and open up people's minds in a way that uh, we don't normally do and ask questions that we don't normally do. Because I think for me, this COVID crisis has been a massive awakening in terms of how to be able to just stabilize and think because there's so much running around, traveling this, that, and the other, we end up forgetting ourselves and, and having peace and, and having that time for introspection and reflection. Um, all of those things have come back to me in, a, in, in spades. And I think I'm very grateful for that. Um, Rapid pivoting is another thing that I'm very grateful for. Family life, we're very grateful for. All of these things, I think, is something like you said in one of your slides, that these are the new things that we are discovering. And perhaps the time has come for us to be able to look at a completely new world uh, and, and a fresh new way to, uh, to go into the future. Roberta, any final words? And then we wrap up. No, look, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for, for doing that. I really think that, uh, you know, uh, I love what you just mentioned, for example, the next session. So this uh, uh, wealth and richness of, uh, you know, uh, thinking and different thinking in terms of uh, most of the interesting things happens at the cross of different disciplines or different Absolutely. things. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I love when you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, the, the next sessions and also listening arts, uh, music, uh, film, how that, you know, as, what has that to do with, uh, uh, with uh, what we've been talking today and, you know, bringing this fresh thinking, I think is really, really needed. Um, and I really uh, uh, appreciate, you know, what you're doing here in the region and globally to, you know, um, open up uh, minds to, to uh, diverse uh, 
thinking. So uh, I, I can only but thank you for having me today. As we said at the beginning, there is no wrong or right answer, right? It's more about asking the right questions. It's more about having a conversation, listening to people, give feedback, being there to help, uh, be genuine and authentic. So there are, there are many things to, uh, when it comes to mindset. Uh, so uh, uh, yeah, uh, I hope this is not just a conversation, but you know, it becomes more a platform what you're doing for people to connect to you know, uh, these values and this thinking and then you know, act accordingly. Indeed, uh, Roberto, thank you very much indeed. You know, when, when you come to the end of a session which has already gone on longer and you still feel it's not completed, uh, it's actually a good sign, which means that by the end of June, when we are reconvening, uh, we will gather our thoughts. Everybody who attended will get an invitation directly. We'll get a, a link of this uh, video or, or also, and uh, we will be in touch. Uh, please stay connected with us, stay on our platform on Exponential Talks. Uh, come back and we do lots and lots of other things um, and uh, and I think next time we'll go deeper into the industries so yep. it will be very practical and more tangible because we need to build the blocks and once we get into the individual industries you will find it more rewarding from that perspective so we'll agree a date uh, book early and then we'll take it on from there folks thank you very much indeed very grateful for today and stay tuned and stay connected appreciate it and stay safe and stay happy because life is going to be good. I tell you, this is going to pass. And, we'll and our hashtag is also Startup Strong. <laughs> Startup Strong, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, super. All right, buddy, thanks very much. Thanks Thank to you. everybody. All the best, cheers, bye. Cheers, bye. bye.